as we move towards Easter, we're going to have a suitable Bible reading this morning. <laughs> this is Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Take this bread. This is my body. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples. And then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 56. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a, long, in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lamech Sabatani, this means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At the moment, the curtain of the, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies 
of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Just for the benefit of those who watch this at home and uh, who watch it in other parts of the country, I thought today um, I'd just explain to begin with why I wasn't on your screens last week and how things are at the moment. Um, the doctors are worried that as well as something being wrong with my eyes, there may be something wrong with my brain. Now I've been convinced there's been something wrong with my brain for many years, but um, they uh, have been doing scans and things on me this week and I am suffering an increase in the amount of pain that I'm working with, which is why I wasn't able to be with you last week and this week why um, I've perhaps done a little less in the service than I would normally do. I would appreciate your prayers. So today we're going to turn to our attention to the events of Good Friday in this part of the service. And I wanted to talk to you from that passage that Jill read, which is in Matthew chapter 27 and verses 45 to 56. If you have a Bible with you or if you have the Bible on your phone or um, however you follow these things. And there are a few points that I would like to particularly point out to you from this passage. The first is that from noon until three, darkness came over all the land. And darkness is a very obvious symbol. But also here, it was a physical reality. This in many ways was the lowest point in human history. This was a situation where God came into the world having taken upon human nature. And sometimes we talk about it as though Jesus dying on Good Friday was a good thing and in retrospect we can say that it was but we have to accept that those who rejected and crucified Jesus did not know that and so when Jesus was crucified the darkness that spread over the world in many ways was God's anger at what was taking place. Even though this was part of God's plan, even though that this was a plan that God had had since before the creation of the world, for us, the human race, to reject him in this final sense is an horrific 
point in human nature. I may have told you this story before, but I, in fact, I know I've told you this story before, but it's one that I always come back to at Easter. I remember some years ago when the film The Passion of the Christ was popular in cinemas and at some Christian festivals people were queuing around the buildings to get in to see this new film about the life and crucifixion of Jesus. And it became a conversation at a coffee morning at the church that I was then pastor of. And one old lady, who was an interesting old dear, she said, oh, I think it's terrible. If only he'd been born in England, we would never have done that to him. And oh, yes, we would. And the sign that human nature does not get any better is writ large over our world today. You know, when we talk about the war in Ukraine, it is a war that didn't have to be. It is a war where a man who is patently evil has instructed soldiers to bomb buildings that are homes of civilians, hospitals caring for civilians, and all in the name of who can put their name on a piece of land. And if we go back through history, the Second World War, ancient Greece, ancient Rome and Babylon, we find that this has always been the way. But God, to come directly to his people, And then to find that he is hung upon a cross. But even in this, people then found some hope. Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic. And it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, why would he cry that out? Well, part of it is that it was a confirmation of part of one of the Psalms in the Old Testament. And Jesus was saying that something here that God has predicted is being fulfilled. But we have to acknowledge also that when we were working our way through that prayer that Joshua and James led us in earlier, in an absolute sense, God cannot abandon God. There is only one God. And the Father and the Son cannot abandon each other. Because otherwise you'd end up for a moment that there would be a schism in time where there would be two gods, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit could choose which part to take.
But in terms of Jesus' human nature, he was dying alone. He was dying the death, the kind of death that we face. The kind of death that we have chosen because of our rejection of God. People sometimes ask, you know, if the first man and the first woman had not done wrong, would they have died? And I have to say, why are you looking to me for an answer? We never got that far. They did do wrong. And therefore they did die. <coughs> and here we have a man who did no wrong. And he is dying. The Old Testament reminds us that there is no man righteous. No, not one. Until this day, when a man who was absolutely righteous came to the end of his life without sinning. And that was the first and last time in human history. And for that reason, we can be counted as being without wrongdoing, even though we have done wrong because Jesus died in our place Jesus is our substitute Jesus won the victory over death but here even there are those who are looking for hope because it had been prophesied in the very last book of the Old Testament that before the Messiah came, Elijah would come. And so when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, there were those who hoped that he was calling for Elijah, even though Eli Lemmy does not construct Elijah. And Elijah wasn't coming. Indeed, Jesus had said that if we would accept it, John the Baptist was the Elijah who must come. But there were those, even at the moment of Jesus' crucifixion, that were desperately hoping that God would do something. And this should be our point of view as we look out into the world today. I don't know how the pandemic got started. I don't know whether it was an accident in a laboratory. I don't know whether it was caused by uh, wet food being sold on a market somewhere in China. I don't know. But our hearts should be pleading that God will do something to bring it to an end. I don't know what is going on in the mind of a madman like Putin. But our hearts should be pleading that God will bring it to an end. I don't know if you ever saw the film. This is a great film. If you haven't seen this, I know it's like an unwritten rule these days that uh, you don't watch a film unless it's less than six months old. You know, it's like uh, when people went to the cinema, which I, they don't seem to be doing anymore now, we've got the pandemic, but when they went to the cinema, they only went to see really new films. 
and when they watch uh, Netflix or something like that, they only watch pretty new films. In fact, we're told that most of the older films are pretty politically incorrect anyway. Every day there seems to be a list in the news of films that have won Oscars that shouldn't have won Oscars um, because of this reason or that reason. In fact, the films shouldn't ever have been made. Uh, the Oscars now only are a ceremony where people beat each other up on the stage. I have no idea who won most of the, f the film awards, but we know what's in the news about that ceremony. But back in the day when people used to make films about things like the crucifixion, the resurrection, the great stories of the Old Testament. There was a film made called The Robe. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but um, it is a work, in my mind, of genius. I'm reading the book at the moment, and the book is, is pretty good. But it took Richard Burton, a Welsh actor, a British man, one of the ones who would not have crucified Jesus if he'd have been born here. To make this to the next level. He played the centurion who stood at the foot of the... Well, actually, I think he plays the tribune rather than the centurion. But one way or another, he ends up with the robe that Jesus wore prior to his crucifixion. And for the rest of his life, it haunts him what he has seen out on that desolate field on that barren tree until Burton's character gives his heart to God there's a slightly dubious end scene where um, Richard Burton's character and the woman that he marries kind of float off to a heavenly background but hey I'm not sure that could have been done any better with CGI these days but I'll forgive them that one but what we do know we don't know where the road went and that book and film were made because the wife of the author of the book said to him one night I wonder what happened to the robe and so he wrote a book about it and I don't know if it's true or not but it's a good it's a good yarn but what is true is that the centurion who was sat, sat, stood at the foot of the cross said surely he was the son of God in one film, I forget which one that is, uh, the character of the centurion is uh, played by John Wayne, who didn't think that um, it was worth adopting a different accent than he had in all of those cowboy films. And it sounded more like Shirley than Shirley. But um, we need to stop for a moment here and consider the Greek language in which the New Testament was originally written. Because a better translation than what we have here is that um, the centurion says, Surely he was a son of God. Or surely he was a son of God of the gods so what we're not talking about here is some kind of instant conversion from paganism that the Romans believed in to Christianity not even Richard Burton could pull that one off but as he stood and so Jesus died dying then he realized that the dignity of the way that this man died 
showed that he must be someone who was close to the one who made heaven and earth. And finally, as we come to the end of our wanderings through this passage, we find at the or near the foot of the cross a small group of women. You know? Sometimes you get movements in society that want to say that women are equal to men. Sometimes men want to say that they are superior to women. In this thing of what is most important here, we're not talking about women being equal to men. We are talking of women being superior to men because there are no men near to the foot of the cross they've all gone they've run away they will need to build their bridges later but the women Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons, they're there, right to the bitter end. And when it comes later to visiting the tomb, it is a woman who is first into the tomb. So there are all kinds of role models here. If you're a man, you can make a woman your role model and you can steer, stay near to the cross this Easter. If you're a woman, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons can be the ones you emulate. Others can be like the centurion who grows in understanding. Others can be those who hope that God is doing something. And whilst Elijah doesn't need to come. That this Easter points to Jesus coming again. And that the injustice and war and hatred will come to an end. Our God has not forsaken us. He is close even through this world's troubles. And Easter must be a time when we look for him. Amen.